Recently, I've been going through the Sega Game Gear's library, which to my surprise has been consistently impressive with the titles it has to offer. Not to get too much into the history of the Game Gear, but it has a pedigree of being nothing short of a handheld master system, hindered as most things were in the 90s by poor battery life, and having the unfair disadvantage of going up against one of gaming's biggest pop culture phenomenons. Where the Game Gear came into its own though, was the support that Sega showed towards its software. Rather than creating games that were better suited to a handheld device, like pick up and play puzzle games, they focused on bringing the home console quality games into your pocket. If your pocket was big enough of course. I was really surprised to see just how many of Sega's franchises made it onto the Game Gear, and how well they actually still hold up. My only knowledge of Shinobi on the Game Gear up until the point of playing them was a few screenshots here and there, and a couple of hints in my Dirty Rotten Tips book. I had assumed it just to be a watered down version of the Mega Drive release of Revenge of Shinobi or a straight up copy of the Master System slash arcade port. But to my surprise there was not one but two games developed for the Game Gear, which branched off from the console and arcade releases into something unique. The first of the two games begins in true Power Rangers style by showing off four additional palette swap ninjas to our canonical protagonist, Joe Musashi. Jumping into the game we are presented with our first deviation from the franchise in being able to select our starting level. Each level takes place in a completely different setting, your motivation to proceed through each one being the rescue of one of your fellow ninjas. No matter which starting mission you choose, the first one you'll probably notice is our character sprite. This is a fairly decent 8-bit approximation of the 16-bit Joe. The walk cycle and sword attacks are virtually identical to what we would see on the Mega Drive, other than a drop in pixel and colour count. To accompany walking around and slashing, we can also jump, and that's pretty much it for a short while. Levels, as to be expected, are platform based, containing numerous enemies which coincide with the theme of each level, pitfalls, traps and items to pick up, pretty standard stuff. Where the game starts to get more interesting is following on from the stage boss fights. Depending on what level you complete, you'll be rewarded with unlocking one of your fellow ninjas, each represented by a different colour. And each ninja can be switched to on the fly by pressing start and choosing them from the menu. This is where most people will make the comparison with Mega Man as each ninja is host to a unique weapon, special ability and ninjutsu. Sadly, Joe Musashi doesn't possess any special abilities other than the power of being red, but he can call in an earthquake to destroy rocks and enemies. Mr Blue has what the instruction manual calls a crescent blade yo-yo which can hurt multiple enemies at a time and be used as a grappling hook to swing across the map on certain round pegs. He can also turn into a whirlwind, which is massively useful in almost any situation. Yellow possesses the power of the Shinobi Force, a fireball attack which can be powered up by holding the attack button, along with ninjutsu which allows him to be invincible to attacks. They also have the ability to walk on water, which I wish I had known before reading the manual, it would have saved me banging my head against the wall listening to the death chime. Pink has brought with him one of my favourites from the arcade game, in form of bombs, and he can pull a Spider-Man by crawling across the ceiling. His ninja magic allows him to freeze enemies on screen so he can politely walk away. And lastly we have Green, who dons the throwing stars we are accustomed to, along with the always useful double jump complete with 5 way attack. Green ninjutsu allows you to explode, taking up one extra life but refilling your life bar, which can get you out of a boss scrape. Levels are horizontal and vertical scrolling, and laid out in such a way that isn't directly linear. You'll ascend to avoid pitfalls and obstacles, and depending on the order you unlock your squad in, you can use your abilities to gain access to areas that would otherwise be unreachable. The enemies you face in the game come in a few different varieties. You have your standard close range attackers, which can be easily dispatched with a sword, projectile enemies, which will take a bit of platforming to dodge out of the line of fire, and transforming enemies, which are downright annoying. Fighting your way through each stage will come across item boxes. These more often than not contain a bomb, but usually just in the nick of time you will obtain a health or ninjutsu pickup. There are also upgrades to your health bar scattered throughout each level, and these will require a certain amount of exploration to obtain. The levels aren't massively long, but they're broken up into different sections, usually transitioned to by entering through a door. I quite like this feature. When present, it helps to give the level an interior and exterior, which synchronises with your vertical scaling. It isn't anything that's massively innovative, but it helps the monotony that can come from simply walking from left to right. 
Making your way through each stage, you will face the staple of any retro game, a boss fight. These can initially be strikingly hard, as the key to success is through pattern memorization, but once you have that down, you'll slide into a rhythm and make easy work of them. One boss in particular that caused me a lot of grief was at the end of the valley level, who teleports around and needs to be hit within a second or two of spawning. Seemed impossible until I realised that I could just stand in one spot and the game would always put him right in front of me. Once all ninja friends have been acquired, you are onto the last stage and this is where the game takes a shift and becomes more interesting. One of the problems with having levels that can be played in any order of your choosing is that the abilities that come with each new character never fully get utilised in the starting stages as it's never certain that you'll have the appropriate colour to pass each hurdle. The final stage however won't unlock until you have all 5 characters and the developers took full advantage of designing a level with that in mind. From here on out, the game is a huge maze filled with environment and platforming puzzles, pitfalls and the stage bosses we fought prior. Whilst this is technically only one stage, it easily matches the length of the first four stages if you don't know directly where to go, and the difficulty is bolstered threefold by the unpredictable layout of each room. It kind of reminds me of the film Cube, where each room is a different colour, with a new way of finishing you off unexpectedly. Each room will often conclude with one or more door to go through, and some of these will set you back whilst others will progress you forward. It's a completely different pace to the first half of the game, and one that can range from being rewarding to infuriating. Some rooms are specifically designed to make you learn by failure, but I can't condemn the game too much for it. All it's doing is adopting the pattern learning required to get past the enemies and bosses to the levels, and if the game were too easy, it would probably be quite boring. Frustrations aside, Shinobi is a joy to play, this is obviously being emulated and even stretched to 1440p, the design of the game is realised enough that everything on screen is clear. Often blowing up pixels and not viewing them from their intended distance can make for a blocky convoluted mess, but here it adapts perfectly. Combat in the game never gets boring due to the switching between ninja weapon types, and enemies are varied enough that you'll adopt a different method of taking out each one. The music is also serviceable, being helmed by Yuzo Koshiro, and we even get a reprise of the boss music from Revenge of Shinobi. I think my main criticism of the game is that the abilities acquired by each different character feel a little underutilised and the difficulty has a sudden spike in the last level. That can't be said, however, for the sequel. Released a year later, Shinobi 2 The Silent Fury follows the same themes of the previous game by having our five ninjas taking centre stage. This time, however, the Techno Warriors have not only kidnapped all the ninjas, other than Joe Masashi of course, but they've also stolen four crystals of power. Things kick off alarmingly similar to the first game. We have to rescue four ninjas and we have four stages to choose from, with a fifth being unlocked when we have collected all that we need. Keeping on course, not much has actually changed gameplay wise. However, there is an immediate noticeable improvement to graphical design and soundtrack. Enemies are also more varied this time round with more frames of animation and stage bosses are more articulate and interesting to fight. Upon first playing, you might be mistaken for thinking that this is just a rehash of the first game with different enemies and environments. However, for all the comparisons and shared assets, the game has a few differences which makes it a much more enjoyable experience. The first big change is with your yellow ninja who no longer possesses an enormously overpowered magic shot. Instead we have a giant throwing star in its place that boomerangs allowing you to attack enemies on its return. I'm not an enormous fan of this weapon, it's definitely the one I use the least as it's rather slow and has a limited range. Some of the ninjutsu has also been changed around, our earthquake attack has now been given to the green ninja which has freed Joe Musashi up to take on a new spell. Located towards the end of each level, you will come across a box that once opened will reveal a downwards red arrow. The first time playing, I mistook this for being one of the crystals of power. Instead it acts as sort of a checkpoint, allowing us to use our ninjutsu to walk back there instantly from any part of the level. This might seem a bit unnecessary, however it helps to accompany the biggest improvement over the first game, which is in the level design. The first time you traverse through each of the four starting stages, you will notice areas that you currently have no means of getting to. These will usually be situated too far out of the way, reachable by a double jump or over pitfalls requiring the crescent blade. There are also environmental obstacles to overcome, such as water or barrels which will require you to use the earthquake ninjutsu to clear. None of these will stop you from critical pathing your initial run and making it through to the boss fight, allowing you to obtain all of your ninja friends, 
but once you have them all, you then have all the tools you need to go back a second time to fully explore these levels. It might seem like padding to get you to play through the same stage multiple times in a row, but because of how each map is laid out, I never felt like I was playing it just to waste time. The levels become slightly maze-like, with various doors, dead ends and tunnels for you to venture down, and you will need to explore all of these avenues as hidden within previously inaccessible parts of the stage are the crystals that must be required to unlock the final dungeon. I really like this. My main complaint about the first game was that the final area was so full of imaginative puzzle platforms that once you experienced them, it made the opening stages feel a bit flat. But here they appear to have started with the same mindset and created levels that are not only bigger and more fun to play, but they change the pace of your progression. With no reason to explore, you would make a beeline for the exit to fight the boss, but now we have to take our time and look around for things that we might have missed. Delving further into the secrets of each level will also reveal health power pickups, and I'd say these are essential as the final stage is expectedly hard. This, like its predecessor, is screen by screen of environment traps and puzzles set out to give you a pretty quick demise. One standout difference this time round though, is that whilst it is hard, it's not annoying. There were multiple times during the first game where I thought the deaths were the result of not a fair challenge, whereas here, everything can be overcome more by applying logic rather than testing reflexes. If you do get stuck on what to do, just look at the background colour of each room, it pretty much spells out which ninja you need to use to overcome each hurdle. That's not to say that these are all puzzle rooms though, if you count the final form of the last battle, there are pretty much 10 bosses to fight in this stage. Shinobi 2 is the perfect example of making just a few improvements to a game to take what was good and make it into something that's great. I had a blast playing through both of these, and at no point did they feel like games that were developed in the years that they were. This kind of retro style of game and visuals is something that is seen more and more with the growing indie scene, and I think if they didn't hold the intrigue of being a hidden gem of a franchise on a forgotten device, the gameplay and design would still hold my attention. The biggest shame of playing these games though is that we never saw any other Shinobi games like this given how well the spin-off concept of having multiple characters worked in execution. I believe there may have been releases on the 3DS eShop of the second and possibly first of these games, but what I'd love to see is a full re-release where they take both games and combine them into one big game. It also works as kind of a proof of concept of what a Shinobi Metroidvania game could look like, one that isn't a slash em up like the Strider reboot. The more I dig through the Game Gear catalogue, it really is throwing out some gems that deserve a little more recognition, and it's even had me looking at modded LCD consoles. Anyway, in whatever method you are able to play the Game Gear Shinobi games, if you are a fan of the series, or even the genre, I'd strongly encourage you to do so.